The previous video introduced resampling methods by using the example of bootstrapping a confidence interval on a single parameter. Um, it's, but these methods can also provide the ultimate in sort of non-parametric approaches for performing two sample tests, things analogous to the classical tests that we've been talking about throughout this class. So this video covers these approaches, which are a variety, including randomization, bootstrapping, as well as Monte Carlo analysis. So first, a bit of terminology. Um, the names given to these different techniques are really not used that consistently in the literature, but I'll sort of stick with this framework here for terminology in, in this video. So in general, resampling methods use repeated draws from the actual data. So it either reshuffles them, or it resamples them, or it also can subsample them. Um, so the framework here arranges them sort of by distance from the empirical reality of the original data. So we'll cover randomization, which just reshuffles the original data, but it keeps all the values. It uses them all once. We'll also discuss bootstrapping, which was covered briefly in the previous video, which uses the structure of the sample, so their sample size, but it randomly samples from the data. Um, or we'll also briefly talk about parametric bootstrapping, which creates models that are informed by the data. And I'll finally just touch on Monte Carlo or model-based Monte Carlo analysis, but that's a bit beyond the scope of our class. So to consider how resampling methods can be used for two sample comparisons, testing for a significant difference between the two, for example, let's recap the traditional parametric method. So take the example of the t-test. The null hypothesis is that the two samples come from a population with the same mean. And we get the p-value, which is an estimate of sort of how likely there is how to be a difference. And that's the probability of obtaining a difference between means at least as large as observed if the two samples did come from the same population. So that's, I've been using this, this phrasing throughout all the previous videos, and so hopefully you're fairly comfortable with it now. Uh, because it's that last part, the idea that the two samples came from the same population is the key to starting this resampling approach for this sort of test. We can essentially simulate what it would be like if the null hypothesis was true by pooling the two samples into a single population. So we take our two samples and put them together into one big sample, sort of shuffling up all the data into one pool. So this basically is simulating what the case would be if the null hypothesis is true. Remember, the null hypothesis is that they came from populations with the same mean, or they came from the same population. So the next step has a couple different options. And the first one is to consider it's a method called randomization, also sometimes called permutation. So but what we're going to do in this one is that we're going to randomly resample that pooled data without replacement. So we keep the structure of the original samples, so our, we'll, we'll create two new random groups. One will have four and one will have three observations in this example here because in our, in our original data, sample one had four observations and sample two had three. This is what I mean about keeping the structure. So we're going to use the sample size structure from the original data to make our simulated data. So it's possible to examine all possible outcomes which is called systematic permutation. If the, it's, it's possible to size, if the sample size is small, but it's much more common to, to just perform many randomized trials. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the data into one pool and then randomly resample that, which essentially just reshuffles and reassigns the observations among the new samples. We're sampling without replacement, so all of the original observations are sampled once. We don't leave any out. They all get taken and put once into our random groups. So we do this and we calculate the difference between the means with the random group because this is the null hypothesis, right? We want to know what are the distributions of means if the null hypothesis is true. Right, so let's return to that first part of the p-value. Right, the p-value is the probability of obtaining a difference in means, for example, at least as large as observed. Right, so in a parametric test, the theoretical distribution, like the t distribution or whatever, tells us what to expect if the null hypothesis is true. And we compare our result to that theoretical expectation. But in the resampling methods, what we're doing is we're 
repeatedly resampling the pool data to give us an empirical sampling distribution. So what we're doing here is basically simulating what sort of differences in means we could expect if the null hypothesis was true by essentially making the null hypothesis true by grouping them together and then randomly pulling them back out and making a whole bunch of random simulations in that, in that sort of um, universe. Right, so that's what this distribution is. This histogram here tells us what sort of range of differences in means we would expect if the null hypothesis is true. And we want to know what's the probability of observing a difference at least as large as the one we got. So we just look to see how many of the absolute randomized differences. Remember, we have to look at both tails of the distribution, not just the one where our observed difference is. So we look at the proportion of absolute randomized differences that are greater than or equal to the observed difference. So in this trial, I did 10,000 random permutations, and 551 of those were at least as extreme, sort of in either direction, as the observed difference in mean. So our p-value is just 551 divided by 10,000, or 0.0551. It's also possible to do two sample bootstrapping. Uh, in this case, we still pool the samples, right? We, we're simulating what would happen if the null hypothesis is true, but then when we sample that pool, we still retain the structure. So we still have four observations in group one and four in, and three in group two, right? So that's still all the same, but what we're doing now is we're resampling with replacement. So this is actually much more common probably than, than true randomization. So the previous video discussed how this resampling with replacement during bootstrapping allows some observations to be drawn multiple times, other ones maybe not at all. And so this leads to a wider range of parameter values like mean or median than is possible from just the sample itself. Essentially what we're doing here um, is extrapolating more to what we might expect from the population. So the p-value is calculated in the same way. Um, pooling the sample simulates the null hypothesis, and then randomly drawing our resamples gives us a distribution of parameters that we would expect if the null hypothesis is true. And then the p-value is just the proportion of those differences in an absolute sense, because we look at both tails, at least as extreme as the observed parameter. So here it's 0.0512. It's essentially almost exactly the same as the, the previous one. So randomization and bootstrapping are, are quite similar. They only differ in whether you sample with replacement or without replacement. So how do they compare? When should you use one versus the other? Well, in randomization, each data point is resampled once, and all are included. But in bootstrapping, some points might be resampled more than once, and others maybe not at all. So as a result, bootstrapping sort of attempts to extrapolate beyond the sample, to the range of variability that we might expect if we're sampling from the population itself. Randomization doesn't. So as a result, randomization is sort of strictly applicable when the sample is the population. And this is maybe the case when you're comparing experimental results. You know, you did a bunch of experiments and you want to know what's the probability of observing this sort of outcomes. Um, and bootstrapping is more applicable when your sample is much smaller than the population, which is most of the time in sort of observational statistics. So resampling the data is what most people think of as bootstrapping, but it's also possible to use the data itself to choose some distribution, determine the parameters of that distribution, and then randomly simulate data with the structure from the original data. So this is called parametric bootstrapping. And it has the benefit of simulating a broader range of outcomes. So it's more analogous to repeated sampling from the overall population, right? Even, especially if the sample size is small, we're still kind of constrained by that limited number of observations in our original sample. But if you simulate a distribution, you can get a much broader range. So this is probably good if the sample size is very small. However, the potential downside is that getting the correct result depends on choosing the proper distribution. And this is a little bit beyond what we're going to cover in this class, but just to, to point out sort of the benefits and the drawbacks of parametric bootstrapping. And finally, just a quick word about some more model-based Monte Carlo approaches. 
So far, this video has talked about data-based Monte Carlo, like bootstrapping, but it's also possible to use the observations to generate theoretical models that are resampled, or instead of actually even resampling data, we can just simulate observations based on expected distributions. So we might expect that the distribution or the data should follow some distribution based on under our understanding of the underlying processes, or this is actually relatively common as well. We maybe want to simulate something called a null model, which is like a random distribution. We want to know, does my observed distribution of data differ from what I might expect if it was just a random process? And so we can simulate a random process a whole bunch of times and see how our observed data differs from that. So creating these models requires a fairly detailed understanding of your particular research topic, which is beyond what we're covering in this class. But I, I will note that these models can be very powerful and are very useful, particularly this null model thing in, in the geosciences. Null models are very useful in geosciences to sort of test whether your observations differ from just random processes.